All right, today we're going to be talking about the pupil. And there are two pieces, the afferent pathway, which is the light going in, and the efferent pathway, which is the motor response. So the classic diagram has it starting with the eyeballs, the optic nerve, the chiasm. And before it reaches the geniculate body, the pupil fibers come off of the optic tract and go to the dorsal midbrain syndrome. And so those dorsal membrane centers uh, control the pupil efferent pathway, and that's at the Edinger-Westphal nucleus of the third cranial nerve. And then the cr third cranial nerve carries the pathway to the ciliary ganglion and the postsynaptic, uh, postganglionic fiber from the ciliary ganglion uh, carries the rest of the way to the pupil. So when we have the afferent signal, it actually starts here in the retina at the level of the retinal ganglion cell and travels along the optic nerve. The temporal fiber remains uncrossed, the nasal fiber crosses, but the pupil fiber then comes off of the optic tract to go to the pretectal nuclei in the dorsal midbrain, and then to the efferent pathway, which is carried on cranial nerve three. So you need to know both the afferent and the efferent pathway when we're discussing pupil problems, because when you have a afferent problem, we have two ways of detecting this. One is a relative afferent pupillary defect. So the light reaction to the right eye is actually received at the level of the Edinger Westphal nucleus by both pupils. And that means we have both a direct response to light, but also a consensual response. So in, in order for us to detect the RAPD, we're going to swing the light from the normal pupil. So in this case, the light reaction to the right pupil constricts both pupils. And when we swing the light to the left, it should normally stay the same. But if we swing the light back to the right, and there's a right relative afferent pupillary defect, then that pupil will dilate. But because of the direct and the consensual response, the left pupil also dilates. So really when we have an RAPD, in this example on the right side, both pupils dilate when we swing the light from the left, the normal eye, to the involved eye the right, and when we swing from the right, the involved eye to the left, both pupils constrict. And so when we have a RAPD, we are actually taking advantage of the relative difference in the afferent pathway to the pupil, and that's what tells us that there's a defect. What if you have bilateral involvement of both eyes, and it's the same in both eyes, so let's say both eyes are count fingers vision in both eyes because of an optic neuropathy, then we won't have an RAPD because relative to the fellow eye, there's no relative difference. And so in that setting, we can use the near reaction, and that is light near dissociation. So the light pathway will be impaired, but because the edinger westphal nucleus can receive signal from the more rostral midbrain for the near reflex, and in fact, you can be completely blind and still generate a near reflex. So in someone who has no RAPD because they have bilateral and symmetric, but anterior visual pathway disease, we wanna look for light near dissociation. Unfortunately, that light near dissociation can also occur in efferent pathway disease. So the disconnection can occur here at the dorsal midbrain, disconnecting the light pathway from the near pathway. And it doesn't have to be afferent, that can be efferent. And the most prominent is the Argyle-Robertson pupil. So in this location, neurosyphilis affects this pretectal nuclei area and causes the light reaction to be impaired but the near reaction is still good. And so the Argyle-Robertson pupil accommodates, but it doesn't react. It's bilateral, it's a small irregular pupil that goes from tiny to pinpoint and demonstrates light nerve dissociation. You can also have efferent pathway deficits from third nerve palsy, that's the pupil involved third, or from the ganglion, that's usually idiopathic, which we call Addy's tonic pupil. So in Addy's tonic pupil, there'll also be light nerve dissociation because the light pathway and the near pathway are the same initially. However, if you have disruption of the postganglionic fiber or the ganglion, the nerve might regenerate, but aberrantly. So pupils that used to go to the ciliary body for control of the lens now are going to the pupil. So when you think you're doing the near reaction and the light reaction is poor, the ciliary body is thinking it's constricting, but really the pupil is constricting because of aberrant regeneration of the postganglionic fiber in the adistonic pupil. So that causes light near dissociation as well. 
But it, the difference between the Argyle Robertson pupil and the tonic pupil is the tonic pupil is tonic. It has a tonic near reaction where constriction stays down. Argyle Robertson is not a tonic pupil. It doesn't react to light, but it does react to near, but it's not tonic. And so efferent disease usually causes anisocoria. If it's the parasympathetic, that's from the Ettinger Westphal nucleus to the ganglion and the postganglion nerve and the iris. And you'll have to look at the video on the Horner syndrome to see anisocoria on the sympathetic side. So in summary, the pupil pathway has an afferent and efferent pathway. The afferent pathway we text for RAPD and bilateral light near dissociation. The efferent pathway is anisocoria, either the Horner's pathway for the sympathetics or for the parasympathetics the third nerve, the ganglion, and the postganglionic nerve, and we're going to be looking for light near dissociation.